Even if they, they're all, huh? Unmute one and see if I can get some. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, they're all coming back? Yeah, they're all, well, I don't know if they, I don't know if the speakers have them on or not, actually. Yeah, so we've got zero time. They may have them off. Okay, turn on the, uh, the, uh, or the, uh, the four. Okay. Oh, good, we got the Probably applies in either category. <laughs> They're the most comfortable ones that we have, though. So. All right, good morning to each of you, and uh, thank you for uh, being here for the 9 o'clock uh, panel discussion. Um, in just a moment, uh, these gentlemen are going to introduce themselves, but before they introduce themselves, I've asked uh, David Deffenbaugh, if he will, to begin by leading us in prayer. Let's bow together. Our gracious and holy God, we thank you for another day of life, for the privileges and opportunities that they afford us, the challenges that will lie before us this day. Father, we pray that, that we'll be led by your spirit that we will be a reflection of your, your character uh, in all things. We're grateful for this program and another day today for this program. And Father, for the book of Job, it challenges us greatly. But we know, Father, that there is blessing, great blessing to be found in it. We pray that you'd be with uh, each, as, each of us as members of this panel, Father. We seek to know and understand and apply uh, your word, and we pray that our time together this morning will be beneficial to all. In Christ's name, amen. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. Okay, so uh, just to kind of let everybody know the way this is going to be set up. This is going to be um, 
for the most part, very casual, very comfortable, conversational. Um, about a month ago, I gave each one of them a list of questions that were possible discussion points. Uh, what they don't know up until right now, though, is I've doubled that list, so they're only prepared for half of it. Um, so we will uh, see how that goes. So some of this is going to be a little bit impromptu, um, but ultimately what our theme is for this panel discussion has to do with prayer and trying to uh, increase our abilities and methods in, the, in our prayer lives and maybe even expand ourselves and in some ways test ourselves this morning on what is appropriate, what is acceptable, uh, how can we approach God um, and still be in a reverent, respectful manner without uh, becoming uh, blasphemous. And so uh, at this time, I'm going to um, let them introduce themselves. Then when we start the panel, uh, essentially each one will have about a couple minutes to give their response uh, to the questions. So we'll start with, with David. All right, uh, David Deffenbaugh. Uh, my wife, Tanya, and I are the parents of two adult children, married and grandkids. Um, I received my BA degree from Oklahoma Christian, uh, also an MA with some additional graduate work at Harding School of Theology. I have to think about what to call that school. Uh, it changes from time to time. Uh, I preached pulpit work for over 35 years, and but for the last three years have been serving as an associate minister here in Paragool at the Center Hill congregation. Uh, I serve, my association with the Crowley's Ridge College is uh, most recently been serving on the lectureship committee um, and have appreciated that opportunity. Um, spent a lot of time in mission work, uh, in short-term mission work, in Ukraine um, for, for many years, so I think that's it. To add to that, he, he forgot to mention, I think, that you're an adjunct professor here, too. Yes, I am. That's so he is uh, one of our I instructors, that. so that is his actually most <laughs> recent contribution to, to CRC. Ooh. All right, Dr. Ryan. Good morning. I'm Ryan Fraser. I uh, teach Bible youth and family ministry and pastoral counseling at Frida Hardeman. I've been there for almost 17 years and uh, married to my college sweetheart, Missy. Uh, she's from Kansas, I'm not, I'm from South Africa. Um, but uh, I've been in the States quite a while, been in ministry for about 30 years, um, youth ministry and then pulpit ministry. Uh, I currently serve as a uh, Preacher and an elder for the Bethel Springs uh, Church of Christ in McNary County. Um, I've got two grown children, a, a married daughter, Olivia, and a son that's engaged, uh, Austin, and a wonderful son-in-law, Dayla. But it's great to be with you today. I appreciate this opportunity very much. I'm Dale Jenkins. Uh, I'd rather not talk about myself. <laughs> wonderful wife named Melanie. We've been married for 41 years. We've been preaching for about 45 years. I have two sons that are in ministry. Uh, honored to be on this panel with these guys. Uh, I preach every chance I get. My goal is to preach 400 times a year for the rest of my life. Uh, I've preached a little this year in 30 states and 8 countries. Uh, I write books and uh, the Jenkins Institute is who I'm employed by named after our dad, my brother Jeff and I run it together. Um, and we just uh, want to help churches, and especially ministers and churches, to be as healthy spiritually as they can be. That's more than you need to know about that. <laughs> I'm Larry McFadden, missionary. Testing. Hello. There it is. Ah, there you go. Larry McFadden. Presently, with the Southern Tomorrow Church of Christ and the Seniors Ministry, uh, actually have been with Seventh Tomorrow since 1978, and I've been preaching for 60 years now uh, on almost a regular basis. Uh, uh, my wife Sue is a girl from Searcy. I met her when her brother-in-law came to uh, Hickory Ridge, which is where Paul McFadden. Technically, is from the county from there. He's a nephew. But uh, uh, Sue 
Sue and I have been married now since 1965, and I graduated from Harding in 66, and then from graduate school in Memphis uh, a few years later than that, 1970, actually. Uh, and I, again, I've been uh, preaching for a long, long time uh, with accumulating children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren along the way, and uh, that's all a lot of fun. Uh, ministry experience, uh, as I said, uh, about 60 years worth of preaching. Uh, I like to go to certain places in ministry overseas. Uh, the favorite one of mine is Kenya, and the Seventh and Lord Church has been involved in that work for, well, I think uh, since back in the early 70s, maybe 73, something like that, and, and I became a part of that and have gone over there quite a few times. So, other than that, uh, let's, let's begin. All right, thank you. So uh, I, I want to begin here, uh, really simple. Um, several years ago, I preached a sermon uh, on the importance of prayer, uh, and I was caught off guard after that sermon when um, an elderly lady, actually, that had been in the church for years, came up to me, and she said, I really appreciate what you had to say, but here I am at such and such age. I've been in the church such and such time and I don't know how to pray. So I kind of want us to start there just in a simple form because it, I guess maybe it's commonplace, I don't know, for people to not really know how to pray other than maybe those routine structured prayers that were taught as children, but to actually learn how to pray. And so, uh, David, we'll, we'll start with you. What, what would you say would be some fundamental principles on how to approach God in prayer? Uh, I would say that to understand what prayer is first of all it's a communication with God and uh, therefore we are to give expression to our emotions our feelings our concerns um, but also that our prayer uh, what I've come to understand is one of the things that lacks most in our prayers both public and I'm going to assume private because I praise but what we lack often is praise in our mm -hmm. prayers sure. um, and we learn our prayer prayers how to pray by modeling that is we hear others pray and we tend to just fall into line with how they pray uh, I think what has been beneficial personally to me um, is reading of Psalms repeatedly reading of Psalms and um, learning the language of prayer from there. Um, so that's just some initial thoughts. Sure. Dr. Frazier, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think there's a difference in uh, public prayer versus personal prayer. Uh, just the format and the expectation as you're praying for the, the family of God um, versus a, a more personal, intimate uh, type of prayer. And I, I think... Um, one of the areas that people get stuck, uh, I do counseling as well, and so sometimes we deal with some of the spiritual blocks that people have, uh, particularly when they're going through a difficult time, and we're gonna get into that in a moment. But um, I try to remind people that prayer, it's, it's a conversation. It's a conversation, and we're both speaking and we're listening in prayer. Very good. So, <clears throat> Rob, you, David, you, you and Rob both said something that I think is worth considering, the, the difference in public prayer and private prayer. But people learn, David, about what they see sure. and what they see in those of us who are ministers. And I don't know how wise you are, Jeremy, putting four preachers up here <laughs> and letting them each have a microphone. But the, the, the challenge is that people learn from what they see and they just see us pray and they see us pray publicly more often than privately. Uh, we're a didactic community, a uh, teaching community. Uh, I, I, anyone who knows me knows how much I believe in preaching, but we're a preaching-centric community where our, our church is, seems like the main course in most of our worship services is the sermon. And so prayer is, has an emotional aspect to it. And so if our focus is on the sermon, it's didactic in nature, it's teaching in nature, and I think it's challenging for us to teach our people where we preach how to pray because the prayers we pray are public prayers, but we're teaching them to pray privately. 
But if we pray our private prayers in public, we end up being uh, more emotional than, than maybe we need to be, uh, and it can be a dangerous thing. So I think it's a challenge for us to teach people how to pray, but uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that I started doing about 10 years ago is I would write every week a, a deeply personal prayer to the congregation where I was preaching, and I would, I would email it to them. And it was yeah. not a public prayer, it was a private prayer. But I would, I would share it with all the members, encouraging them to pray. And so I think the challenge is they learn by seeing how we do that, and the, all they see is our public prayer. So if we can help them see private prayer in a different way, we'll help them more in their prayer lives. Oh, very good. Larry? Uh, I can remember <coughs> when I was probably 19 and preaching at Battle Axe, Arkansas, and we know that congregation. <laughs> Producing preachers out of that. Uh, but uh, there was a, a man I baptized there, had a large family, had no education, literally, uh, couldn't read and write. But he said, I'm a Christian now, I want to know how to pray. And uh, of course, he, his goal was to be able to pray in public. But he said, I don't know how to pray, period. And so we went through that, and, and just he and I met for uh, several Sundays, afternoons, just in the church building, talking together, and I would pray with him and, and allow him to finally could pray. Uh, but very simple, very simple prayer. He couldn't even write it down to read it. And uh, the first time he tried, he opened his mouth in public and backed up. He kept trying to make something come out. He said, I just can't do it. So start with someone like that. And then someone who is, uh, and he eventually did, by the way, and led in public prayer and also in his home, uh, started with the meal time, and uh, we worked through that. But uh, then I can recall one fellow down at Hickory Ridge here not too many years ago. Uh, his wife had leukemia. Uh, she was, was going to die. She hasn't yet because of some miracles that have been performed in that and in the doctor's care. But uh, uh, I said, look, just, if you don't know what to say, he said, I'm furious, I'm angry. How do I talk to God about this? I said, you just, if you don't want to yell at me, you can if you want to yell at me first. Uh, or get in your truck and go off out there in the woods somewhere and just yell at God, shake your fist. Whatever it takes to get those emotions out of you and into God and then then relax and try to feel uh, how you can talk to God in, in a better way. But God's used to us yelling at him. That's, that's a good segue into really the next question and, and kind of what's going to fuel the majority of this. So from this point forward, I do want us to keep everything in the context of, of private prayer. But how, how do we emotionally express ourselves to God and stay within the boundaries of reverence uh, where but at the same time, where we can completely and wholly open ourselves up emotionally before God. And, and I'll just throw that one out there for whoever wants to, to jump in first. All right, Dr. Frazier, we'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe there's a lot of freedom in, in our personal prayer life. And um, what, what are the emotions that good Christian folk struggle with is the emotion of anger. Um, maybe the sense that anger in and of itself is sinful in any form. Uh, the person we see in the Old and New Testament that's angry the most is God, so we uh, know that it's not sinful. It's what we do, what we do in our anger. It's not sin in our anger. Um, and so um, in in our uh, personal prayer life, just the need for authenticity. Uh, God already knows what, we, what we're thinking. Uh, but uh, I believe that God um, greatly values intimacy with us, and that intimacy comes with us being authentic, being real in our prayers. And at times that might uh, be crying out to God, sometimes in anger over the situation that we don't understand. We see Job at times just, in a way, kind of letting God have it. Uh, 
but that's not because he's apathetic, it's he's passionate about that relationship. He's trying to resolve what seems to be a disconnect with God. And so that authenticity is key, um, particularly in times of lament um, in our lives. And about a third of the Psalms are lament songs. So he says, the text says, be angry and sin not. You know, we, we run the gamut on that. We, we, we have unrighteous anger that we justify uh, when we're just mad about, you know, because I got our latte wrong this morning. Or we have uh, no anger, uh, the feminization of the American church, where we have to be sweet and kind to everybody and never express any emotion of anger. And, and we miss on both of those. Uh, the text says be angry. If you can't be angry as a Christian, something's wrong. And uh, we, we have to have correctly placed anger. It really starts, though, with an understanding of the sovereignty of God. If God is sovereign, and I accept that, God is sovereign, I must accept that. So as a sovereign God, if I recognize God that way, is there any question about how David felt about God? I don't think there's any question about the love that David had for God, the devotion, the, where he placed God. But David is more blunt with his prayers than anybody in the scripture. But when anybody will leave that and say, well, David doesn't respect God. So if, if we have the correct understanding of the sovereignty of God and respect for who God is and where God is and what God can do, then for us to take our little anger before God is nothing. It doesn't affect God. It doesn't change God that we're angry about this. And you're right, that, that, that's an overused word, but you know, authenticity that we bring to that is I think that for many Christians, they need to know that God has given us permission to be angry with him. Uh, and that's just, that's what we find in scripture is, you know, a lot of times uh, we think of scripture speaking to us, but I've heard the Psalms characterized as that is scripture speaking for us, that it is allowing us to see, uh, I think it was, uh, Derek Kidner, uh, who is an Old Testament scholar, said that the presence of these kinds of prayers in Scripture where people seem to be, makes us uncomfortable with the way they're talking to God. The presence of those in Scripture show us that God knows how hurt, angry, disappointed people talk to him. And we can do that. I think we have this really bizarre thought in our mind that God only knows about me what I give him. So I've, I've got something, I have something and I have it here and then God only knows about it when I present it to him. Well, that's ridiculous to sure. the extreme. Right. Well, the same is true of my anger or my disappointment or my discouragement, or whatever it is, whatever negative emotion it is, God already knows that and he wants me not to feel like I'm being able to keep it from him, but I'm, I'm, I'm handing it over to him and I'm expressing it to him. That, that's one of the things that, that we see in scripture. And, and I don't know if, if there's a way that we can communicate it better or not, but as you go throughout scripture and you really study people like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, David, even Job and uh, Isaiah, uh, all of these prophets, uh, they were very comfortable in expressing themselves emotionally before God. Many of them are in some way with their prayers that are recorded in scripture uh, tied into a lament type prayer. Uh, Mr. Larry, you had mentioned uh, before we got started up here about your seniority uh, on the panel. So uh, I do want to appeal to you for just a moment since you, you, you're the most seasoned. Um, with that, with your experience, do you believe that the average Christian knows that they can lament to God and how to lament properly before God? The average Christian probably not. And I have uh, uh, thought about the people that, well, one lady over in Tennessee who, uh, when we were hinting, uh, she lost her 12 year old daughter. And she's mad at God. She said, I don't know how to talk to him. All I want to do is shake my fist at him. And so we had to go through that and work our way through it. And the average person really doesn't know the extent to which we can talk to God about the bitterness that we feel or the frustration that we feel. Uh, I guess if you've had children, 
you know a child is two years old, uh, or you can remember a child is two years old, one of the things they love to do is express their independence and stomp their foot and fuss at you. Uh, that's typically the way we behave sometimes toward God. And again, that is acceptable. But the average Christian probably needs to be taught how to be angry and sin not, as you said. Uh, just uh, talking back and forth with a, a young lady who's 28, 29, I guess now. Uh, call her my granddaughter, but she's uh, Kenyan, Tiffany's tribe. And uh, she said, I lost my job. Now what? You know, I've, I've never been so devastated in all my life. And uh, I said, okay, let's go back and look again at your faith in God because your faith level is your level of, of how you're going to talk to God as well. So I said, I've always learned instead of just lashing out at God, first of all, just say, okay, God, what is it you wanted me to learn from this experience? I'm feeling so frustrated, so angry. What did you want me to learn from this? So she's thoughtful and intelligent, and she comes back and says, thank you for that. I'm going to talk to God about it, and I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. So, so taking your illustration of a two-year-old, um, I've got three-year-old twins, so I understand this very, very well at this state in life. But, um, you know, one of the things that we try to teach our two- and three-year-olds, though, when they pitch and scream and, and do that when they don't get their way and they don't know how to really communicate is we try to teach them how to control that anger and to, to communicate that. So, so how, how do we, I, I guess, if there's a maturity element to our prayer, um, how, how do we do that? Like, if it's acceptable to, to kick and scream at one stage, how, how do we grow from that to where we can still be angry and communicate in a more um, mature way, if that makes sense. Is that, is that question coming out as clear as it doesn't sound in my head? The more you know God, uh, the more faith you develop in it, uh, the more you're just naturally going to fall into that discussion with him. Uh, thinking about uh, Jesus and his disciples that last night, there's so much crammed into that last night of the, uh, the upper room and then uh, his teachers and going across the the valley and what he said while they were going across and the fact that he said you're my you're my friends now I, I said now I chose you you're my disciples you're my servants I'm your Lord he gets all of that out of the way but you're my friends and that's because you know my business and from now on uh, ask me anything in my name by my authority whatever you think is in my will and, uh, and you'll have it but they had a a growth period that they had to go through. They kept questioning him, doubting him on occasion, and asking for more. But as their faith grew, by the way, in chapter 15, he talks about the, uh, he's the vine and, and uh, we're the branches, and we get our life from him in order to bear fruit. And he also points out that not only do we bear fruit, but we endure the pruning process. And that's, that's where we run into trouble with God. I like, I like it when God blesses me. But when he starts pruning, I start wanting to argue with him a little bit. One young man said, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why is God letting this happen to me? Well, because he knows you need it. You say you're doing everything you need to do. You sound like Job. Uh, but you need a little pruning. You need a little teaching. You know, a little bit of faith. That pruning process is painful. Very and, you know, I think about uh, the Hebrews writer that says, uh, talking about Jesus, uh, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Yeah. Um, just tying him back to, to the Davidic psalm in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, which is a, a lament psalm. Do, do you uh, think that that came out of anger? Sorry to interrupt you, but do you think that there was a little bit of anger and emotion Sure, you know, there are times that we, we see Jesus being angry. The reason he was suffering was because of the sin of the world. At times he looked at, at sheep without a shepherd as well, and it, it, it uh, upset him internally. I, I think he was angry because of the fallen state of the world. This is not the way it was supposed to be. Uh, well, go ahead, Dale. Uh, 
when going back to your question about maturity, and um, I, I think we have to ask the question about what prompts the anger. If I'm angry with God, what has prompted that anger? What has prompted the disappointment? What has prompted the discouragement? And I think for the most part is that God has, has failed in some way. In my mind, he has failed. Uh, he has not done what he should have done uh, or, or whatever, which means what that means is, or what that's evidence of is my ignorance and, and he's, he's laid that out pretty clearly. Your understanding is here, and his understanding is higher than the heavens. And, and, and we're never going to get there. And that means, therefore, that as we live life, we're going to continue to be angry. The maturity is not going to mean that we're never going to get to a place where nothing that God does is not going to upset us somewhat. Uh, but, but the maturity, I think, comes from... The, the recognition of that fact um, and the fact that, that you're still coming to God. I think that's one of the keys of the book of Job is that he is coming to God with this always. Um, if I'm upset, if I'm angry with my wife, it's very inappropriate me for me to talk to you, Jeremy, about my wife. The appropriate thing is for me to talk to my wife about this. It doesn't take the anger away necessarily. Well, it will, but but where do, you, where do you go with this, I think, sure. is, is part of that. Jeremy, Larry said it three times already, and I've been listening to our wise friend over here. Um, he mentioned three people that he's played one-on-one -on -one with that he's trying to. And, and I think the starting point for all this, uh, when you start talking about how you help people mature, is our own maturity. If, if we're immature, then our, our kids are going to be immature. When my boys were growing up, next door to us lived a family that had uh, two doggone pitchers that were both angry and <laughs> two sons that were both angry. And I learned at some point that the dad had a serious problem with alcohol and he ex his alcohol caused him to be angry. It's not shocking that his children grew up to be angry and cussed and beat up on their dogs and made them angry and everybody around them angry and my children are afraid to go across a certain line in the yard because those kids might beat them up. So how do we help that two-year-old grow? We don't sit in a classroom and say, all right, we're going to teach you today about how to deal with your anger. We demonstrate maturity ourselves, and they learn from watching us. And for those of us who are ministers, those who are elders, those who are elders' wives, those who are teachers in this audience, our, our people that listen to us are going to reflect what we are to a large degree. And so, you know, you, you mentioned Jesus talking to disciples. Uh, he was their teacher. They got to be like him. And when people saw them later on in the book of Acts, we could tell you've been with Jesus. Well, again, people are like the person that teaches them. So if, if we don't ever, if we don't mature ourselves, uh, and, and if we don't help people one-on-one -on -one learn to mature, then they'll never mature to the point that they can lament and have anger and all those emotions put in the proper place. The sure. line that we try not to cross or we should try not to cross. Jesus pointed out that night and then that, that uh, I am your master. Yeah. And that's as he's the king of kings. And you're my servants, but I call you friends. Now you know my business. But you still you think about that relationship we have with him and where we have to learn not to cross the line is He's still the king of kings, even if we're friends with him. And so we have the right to get permission to talk to him about deep things and hurtful things, but he's still the king of kings. And sure. Of course, that's where God drew as well. Sure. We got one question that kind of ties into what we're talking about here for Dr. Frazier, and then I, I want us to move into a, a different direction. There's a couple of other things I really want to make sure that we have time to cover. Uh, but Dr. Frazier, uh, chrono the chronological order of the book of Job is Job, in essence, cries out, screams to God, and then, then he puts his hand over his mouth and he's quiet. Um, it seems to me in my area, or my uh, experience in ministry, that we kind of go straight to the end of the book in the way that we approach God. Like, we're, we're angry, but we feel like we have to keep our mouths shut. So my question is... Um, is it at a disadvantage for Christians 
to keep quiet before God? And if so, how does that negatively impact their spiritual growth and development and whatever dealing with whatever they're, they're having to deal with, especially from a counseling standpoint? I think certainly, you know, if we step, just step back from anger, there's constructive anger and there's destructive anger. And so in our relationship with God, is this constructive anger? Are we turning toward God? Is the fact that we're angry showing we're, we're fighting for our relationship with God rather than fighting against God and turning our back on God? God. Uh, with Job, we see this, this uh, you know, being willing to express his anger, this catharsis. I think there are times that we've got to get it out. If we don't get it out, especially with God, it's going to come out sideways in our behaviors in some way. Um, I believe God would much rather us have it out with him than have it out with our wife or our children because we're stuffing that anger. It's going to come out. And so processing it in a way that, that's, again, truthful, it's real, respectful. I don't think we ought to cuss God out to clarify that, but but expressing that that we are very upset, we're we're mad, we're tense about what what's happened, um, especially around grief and loss. People uh, often kind of lash out at God, but God's shoulders are uh, broad enough to handle our pain. Be with us about that. Okay, uh, switch gears just a little bit. You just mentioned life. So uh, particularly for those of us who work in ministry, um, it tends to be, seems to be in a lot of cases that a ministry's life perhaps takes uh, more scarring and heat than perhaps anybody else in the church. Um, and it's a, it's a high standard being married to a ministry they didn't necessarily ask for, but it just kind of, it just kind of happens. So if, if we kind of um, take just a little bit of liberty with the text and thinking about Job and his wife, but we try to put Job in that ministerial standpoint and kind of look at everything that Job is dealing with more from a imagery standpoint of all these pains and suffering that he's going through as a minister. And then you have his wife who becomes angry at God as a result of watching her husband suffer in such a way. So Job's response to his wife in that moment is, you talk like a foolish woman. So my question is, how, how, as husbands and ministers, first of all, how do we help our wives in this process? Because she was, she lost as much as Job did, and she was just as hurt as Job was. Uh, but yet, in my my judgment, it's almost as though if I responded to my wife the way Job did, I don't I don't think that'd be the correct way to respond. So that would help. So thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the most challenging things that Scripture says to men, particularly husbands, is Peter says it, to live with your wife in an understanding way. I don't understand the female mind. I try, but I don't. And so trying as a minister, putting yourself in your wife's, from your wife's perspective as best you can. And, and you know, the old, you know, we, we euphemize this with the mama bear thing. Exceedingly protective. And I'm grateful for that. But I also then know how that, how that impacts her reaction to her perceived mistreatments or disrespect of me as a minister. And so her emotional response is pretty elevated. And so um, you know, how do you say this without sounding like a jerk? Um, this joke did. Yeah, well, you you tr you, tr you, you try to I keep wanting to say the word manage. You try to manage that, and maybe that is the right word. I don't, I don't care for that word there, but I, um, you know you know what that emotional state is and what the emotional response is going to be, and so you know there are going to be things that are going to inflame that, and so you, you try to deal with that and express that 
if you express it at all in a way that is, is going to be the least inflammatory. So but my so. frustration with, with Texas, Joe, is we see everything worked out for the good for Joe. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just left with a cliffhanger with, with his wife. We don't, we don't know if she ever got past this. We don't know how they, if they were able to ever reconnect on a spiritual level, obviously on a physical because they had the kid, yeah, but on a spiritual level. So, Phil, what would you add to that? Well, there, there is no text that talks about the preacher's wife. Sure. Uh, it, is a, it is a byproduct of being a preacher. And as a preacher, every week someone is critical of what I say, either to my face or behind my back. But for every, but that is that's three percent of my audience. Ninety-seven percent of my audience is kind and gracious to me, and I hear the ninety-seven percent. Sometimes the three percent gets inside our head. Preacher, don't let that happen. But the ninety-seven percent is kind and gracious to us and builds us up and tells us good things. Our wife often only hears the three percent. She's not standing in the back door after a sermon to preach. People say, "Well, it's a great lesson. Preach what you said about this." All she hears is the criticism. And David, I think you did well by talking about the criticism toward the preacher himself. But what I learned years ago in dealing with, with my wife is that she's my wife. There is no biblical text that says the preacher's wife. There are texts about the elder's wife, some deacon's wife. Know about nothing about the preacher's wife. And so she's my wife. By virtue of being a preacher, she's a preacher's wife. But I never let her believe she was a preacher's wife. She's my wife. And we're one. And we work together. We deal with problems together, and we argue together, and we love each other together, and all those. So there's nothing I've ever made my wife do in my mature years that uh, <laughs> it's a learning process. <laughs> that, uh, that 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 I made her do because she was a preacher's wife. Early on, I would make her go to the holiday party. My wife's introverted. I'm not. I love parties. She doesn't. I would make her go to parties because she, you know, she needs to be there. And at some point, I turned made a turning point. I, probably 20 plus years ago, where it's like, you're my wife, you're not the preacher's wife anymore. And your, your, your only job is to take care of me, and my only job is to take care of you. Those are first responsibilities. I know that's overstating the case, but there's a large, in, in this relationship, that's where it is. And so we've got to be together in things. And I understand and appreciate, I appreciate when I'm mistreated and my wife is angry about it. I think, I personally think Job got it wrong there. I don't think there's anything wrong with Job's a human. He, he, he was not a perfect man. He was a maturing man. I appreciated what somebody said yesterday about Job being a better man at the end of the book. Job wasn't a bad man at the beginning of the book. He was a good man. God said he was a good man. So he's a good man. Uh, a mature man. But he's more mature as he goes. And so this is us in our relationship with our spouse and, and in helping them deal with the anger they have and each her dealing with anger that I have when I'm hurt, and me dealing with anger she has when she's hurt, regardless of where that hurt comes from, is a maturity process. In our life. So, so as the head of the house, do, do we encourage our wives to walk that along, or do we guide them in the process? I, I was, I appreciate Dale's comments very much. By the way, I'm a little afraid of my wife. <laughs> uh, so I, I treat her with much reverence and respect. Uh, she told me that if I stepped out on her, that I should never go to sleep. <laughs> and I believe her. Um, but I, I think a lot of ministers and missionaries that I work with in, in counseling wives, um, I'm, I'm surprised by how many ministers do not pray with their wives. There's a lot of ministers that do not pray with their, their wives. Maybe they're the minister to everyone in the congregation, but they're not a minister to their wife. And so for providing that spiritual headship uh, in the home and uh, coming alongside of our wives and praying together, uh, sharing, you know, that, but we need to take the lead in that process. And so many times I think in our home when stress and criticism comes, we try to deal with it in a worldly way or psychological way. And that's the psychological ways of fine. But what about the spiritual component? How can we grow as a couple? together, not just a ministry couple, but just a Christian couple. How can we grow and pray together through these uh, difficult times? Okay, we're, we're running out of time. There's 
couple of other things I want to get to really quick. Um, in Job chapter 7, verses 17 through 21, Job uh, speaking out says, What is man that you make so much of him, and that you set your heart on him? Visit him every morning, and test him every moment. How long will you not look away from me, or leave me alone to I swallow and I will spit? If I sin, what do I do to you? You watch your mankind. Why have you made me your heart? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie on the earth, and you will seek me, but I shall not be. You know, when, when Job writes this, uh, immediately what I take out of this text is, is you're hearing the voice of somebody at least, at the very minimum, clinically depressed. As you go through the entire text of Job, maybe borderline chronic depressed. So my question is, depression seems to be rising. Uh, especially there's been a lot of attention for the last 10 or 15 years on male depression and how it's different than women depression. And but yet we talk about it less, we don't want to admit to it. Typically one of the, I guess, uh, markers of somebody that is depressed is somebody that actually comes across as very confident and bold, um, trying to mask that depression. So my, my question is, from a ministerial standpoint, what can we do to help the men in our church who are confronted with depression, especially when they do not have this avenue with God, they don't know how to communicate to God. So how can we come together, I guess, in more of a man, small group, fraternity type situation or setting and really help men in the church through their depression so that they can actually be their leaders and keep it. One of the best ways, I'm going to jump in really quick, sure. one of the best ways is serving with them, finding, finding something we can go out and, and do together to serve others. Um, I think in that process of looking outside ourselves, and serving side by side with brothers that might be struggling, uh, it, it reconnects them with, or maybe connects them with the, for the first time with other brothers in Christ and gives them a sense of purpose. Um, it's a good distraction. Uh, but uh, sometimes we can talk things to death. A lot of guys aren't big talkers. And so if we can go do something together, let's go and help clean up uh, this tornado relief you know, project. Let's go work together. Uh, that can go a million miles, I think, in helping treat depression, feeling lost and feeling bad. That anguish. Yeah. Um, there was a time, in fact, not too long ago, that I sat in a, a round table with four different guys who were going through a divorce. Each one of them, their wife had come to them and said, I'm done with you. And uh, at least two of those, they'd already found someone else that they were going to go uh, with. But uh, each of those four guys had that issue and they were all four depressed and they didn't know which way to turn so what happened in that round table was we let each one of them just share his story they talked about everything the anger they felt the frustration the hurt what do i do now what about the children uh, you know all the different issues and among themselves they actually brought out as you said we don't talk about it if, if we just said Let's talk about it and let us all see we're going through the same thing. And I just kind of sat back and waited to let them talk it out. And they helped each other tremendously and they survived. I, I kind of want to weigh in on this for, especially for our, our male Bible makers, but also just any, any males that are in here. Men, by nature, we're not very good at expressing ourselves, especially when we're hurt or, or whatever, expressing our feelings. And that's one of the things that creates challenges within a married relationship anyways because you know our wives do like to express themselves emotionally but we're not as equipped to do that but, but what i wanted you to understand from this is it's at a great disadvantage to service and it actually hurts us worse when we keep those things bottled up and one of the best things that we can do is to have a small group of uh, confidants that we can actually express ourselves and open ourselves up to uh, because a lot of times and, and you are correct healing is just the confession. And I think that's one of the things that we're tremendously missing within the Christian context uh, anyways is, is the element and the purpose and the value of the confession. And in essence, that's what prayer is. One of the aspects of prayer is that's how we confess ourselves to God, but that, that opening 
ourselves up. There's, there's healing uh, to it. So in, in our last uh, four minutes here, I want to look at uh, Job chapter 30, verses 25 through 27, where Job uh, questions says, Did not I weep for him whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the need? But when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil and never still. Days of affliction come to meet me. It almost seems as though when, when Job expresses this, he's saying, you know, when things were good in my life, but things were bad in other people's life, I was there. But now that the tables are turned and I'm in a bad place in my life, where are all these people that I know? I find myself all alone. And that's essentially what you see in the book of Job. And that, I think that's, and I, of course, I spoke on this yesterday, but that's his biggest complaint is that he's been isolated, he's been ostracized, he's all alone, and he's needing some support, he's needing a community to help him through this, and they're not there. And so I, I guess where I want to end with this, and I want, I'd like to get all of your responses on this, how should the church community or the assembly respond to people that are suffering in Job's condition. Because most of the time we were the same way. We see somebody that's hurting and we may have pity for them, but we really want to create as much separation and distance as possible. We don't want to get involved or we don't or we're scared of you know what they're what it's going to require of us. And so how can the church do better about seeing the jokes in our congregation and helping them through this so that they're not all alone and facing confronted by this about themselves? And follow-up question, as ministers, how can we better equip the church for when we start here? Uh, I think part of this goes back to how we have come to function as the church, uh, and that is in mass. That it's the assembly. It's everybody together. And somebody mentioned confession a while ago. Well, why are we un unwilling to confess? Because I don't want to go down there in front of 100, 200, 300, 400 people and say, this is it. But maybe myself and Ryan in private, I can confess to him. Um, we, we have not been good at creating those atmospheres where there are, it's, it's smaller and it's more intimate in that there's an opportunity to, to be able to open up and to just discuss and to say, we, we've just done a, we've done a lousy job offering those kinds of opportunities. And I appreciate you saying that because uh, that's one of my hobbies that I get to speak on. Um, <laughs> for all of those that occurred, what I call the walk of shame, uh, mm -hmm. requires somebody to go before the entire church. James 5 says confess your faults one to another. And, I mean, the way it's presented is not before the public assembly. It's yeah. more in a private yeah. uh, setting. And, and really the context is that confession is to be with somebody that's mature. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm afraid you would get that. I, I really appreciate that too. I think that's that's great. Um, we need to be proactive and uh, don't don't make any assumptions. We shouldn't make assumptions about what people are feeling or not feeling. But uh, I know most most individuals are appreciative if you at least reach out and say, "Look, you know, I, I don't want to overstep anything. I don't want to invade your your privacy. I just want you to know I'm here and I, I'm I'm here to listen." not judgmentally, to, to talk, to be with you. Um, Job's friends did the best service when they kept their mouth shut. And they were just present. We need to be present to people. One thing we need to do is make sure our elders in most congregations have them are uh, aware that uh, dealing with people with issues is really their job. And they, they kind of throw it off on the minister, but a wise eldership will will develop a system where uh, if, well, for instance, I think the Seventh Model for years has, has said uh, uh, publicly, if you want to talk to our elders about anything that you have an issue with, there'll be two, at least two of them waiting for you in a certain room. If you want to go there, then deal with whatever you need to with these wise men. And if they will take that burden upon themselves, as I think they should, then the ministers will not have this big of a uh, So we need to, to teach our elders, if, if we're going to be 
teaching. We need to be teaching our elders, and hopefully they'll learn, yes, this is my responsibility to take care of my flock, and I'm going to deal with their issues privately. All right, the final area of the It's not smart. Uh, the first thing that I'd say is we, we really don't need to stereotype people. Uh, Some men are emotional. They want to express their emotions. We, well, men are stoic and they're quiet. That, no, that's not true. That's stereotype. Some men want to express their emotions. And we, we tend to think that we try to force men who don't want to express their emotions to, to not to express them. And men who want to express their emotions to not express them. It's almost like we do the opposite of those two. We got to deal with people as individuals. There are some women that they're, they're not emotionally based. They're, 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 they're more right brain than left brain. And we, you know, so... I think that's part of it. What I would say in our local churches is, one, demonstrate maturity. Did I say it back to you? Yes. Thank you. I'm not a doctor. I was watching, I was watching the woman out there going. Actually, actually, <laughs> actually I'm a doctor. I've got an honorary doctor. So Good yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, demonstra uh, demonstrate this, the, the healthy sort of emotions in our public services, in our private conversations. Provide opportunities. And, uh, and 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 then be patient with people. And if we put those three together over a period of time, we can develop the congregations that are healthy emotions. You've already said that your outgoing life is yeah. not, uh, but you're one of those guys who models that just naturally because that's your personality. Whereas an introvert doesn't model that naturally; has it's a forced thing. So you guys need to stay busy and, and keep the rest of us going. And 60% uh, of our preachers in Church of Christ are introverts. Yes, right. Everybody thinks so in our studies, 6% of preachers are introverts, which shocked me to know. Well, I appreciate the input. Uh, takeaways from this that I hope that you're all gathering is, one, it is completely acceptable to lament to express yourself emotionally before God. And not only is it acceptable, but it's essential. Uh, for your spiritual development and uh, maturing. Uh, two, uh, we, we've got to do what we can in our homes to lead our lives better um, and, and help them to also deal with the challenges and express themselves before God. And three, we've also got to do better in our churches about, in my judgment, paying attention. We're paying attention to those that are going through Job situations and not ignoring them but really trying to navigate to them as best we can to help them through uh, what they're going through. We will uh, take a break till 10-10, uh, uh, since we went just a little bit long. Uh, at our 10 o'clock, we'll have our classes, so our men will be over here. Uh, our women's class will be over here. We'll start those promptly at 10-10 and conclude those at 10-50, uh, so that we have time to uh, get ready for chapel. Uh, thank, you, thank you for your participation. Uh, Amen. And I thank the audience for uh, listening so much.